Well, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Lawrence Garcia out of uh, New York City, and uh, this is a wrap-up uh, interview uh, regarding EVAR, TVAR, and peripheral interventions. My co-moderator is uh, Dong Hoon Choi out of uh, uh, Korea. Hello. And I will uh, I'll defer to Dr. Choi to start our conversation. Okay. I, I'd like to uh, ask the Dr. Bo. Um, uh, yesterday, you, you did a very, very nice uh, live, live uh, session, by, uh, triple A with bilateral liatri enzyme case, uh, treated with IVD and uh, embolization. And uh, that, pay, that kind of uh, triple A with uh, IVD is very frequent, or? Uh, uh, actually, um, the involvement of uh, iliac artery in patients with the AAA is not infrequent, mm -hmm. but uh, you know uh, we cannot. Uh, we, there are several stra strategies to preserve the uh, flow in the internal iliac artery, mm -hmm. so like a uh, bottom technique, or you can use you know uh, parallel uh, stem graft technique, and uh, and most common I think technique is just, just embolization and extend uh, mm -hmm. the stand up into the uh, uh, external iliac artery. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, in, especially uh, in, in Asia, uh, it is a little bit difficult to uh, have the option of the uh, IBD device for the, this kind of patients because the, there is, this device requires several anatomical conditions. Mm -hmm. And uh, less than 30% of cases, in my case, maybe 10% uh, of cases, you know, meet the, the criteria. So mm -hmm. uh, the use of uh, uh, IBD in the Korean patients is very limited. Mm -hmm. uh, so, however, in patients with bilateral, you know, uh, iliac artery aneurysm, mm -hmm. uh, we need to have a certain strategy to preserve mm -hmm. the flow into the internal iliac artery. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I think we need, uh, we need to have at least one mm -hmm. internal iliac artery uh, patent uh, to avoid, you know, complications related to pelvic ischemia. Mm -hmm. So whenever, you know, the criteria for the use of the uh, IBD uh, can be met, mm -hmm. I think uh, we need to try to use this device. Mm -hmm. at, at the live session, mm -hmm. Bill Gray recommend one IBD and the other uh, uh, iliac artery uh, embolized. So mm -hmm. you uh, uh, yeah. follow the that kind yeah. of recommendation. So, so that was the plan, uh, right? That, that yeah. was my, yeah. my recommendation. Yeah, so, Bill, Bill, that kind of uh, one IBD and the other embolization is, is uh, your routine procedure? That's for you, Bill. For me? Mm. Yeah, I think um, it's, it's nice to preserve uh, the iliac branches, mm -hmm. but there, it's not necessary in most cases mm -hmm. to have both branches patent. And to the extent that you can simplify the procedure, contrast radiation, and everything else, mm -hmm. um, and, and potentially thrombosis and so on. I think it's better to try to, you know, maintain patency into one mm -hmm. uh, branch vessel. It also reduces the cost of the procedure, and without anything, I think, down, downside to the patient. Mm -hmm. I don't know what your thoughts are. Yeah, I agree, because uh, many of these patients are elderly patients, mm -hmm. and I think it is important to keep the procedure simple. Mm -hmm. And I think that is the key to the success. Uh, but, uh, you know, if the patient is young, I may try Maybe to preserve yeah. Yeah. But, uh, but the yeah. challenge has always been, I think, that we find that the iliacs are involved bilaterally, as mm -hmm. you pointed out. Mm -hmm. And many times we try to cheat on one side, yeah. and it never works for the long term. So the IBD mm -hmm. certainly is helpful mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. And then we generally, because our patients are generally older, and yeah. so we'll uh, coil mm -hmm. the other side. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's, it's a technically challenging uh, procedure. But the process is actually fairly straightforward to yeah. what we do. I had the difficulty to, uh, you know, uh, place the snare on the other side at mm -hmm. the right place because of the tortuosity of the iliac artery on the other side. Mm -hmm. Right. So after you change the shears to the longer shears, yeah, yeah, then uh, it was possible mm -hmm. to, you know, place the the snare. And so many patients have very tortuous iliac arteries yeah, yeah. and also annual change, very complicated. Okay. I have one more question to Dr. Goh. You Today you uh, talk about the U.S. Medicaid data, JAMA, and uh, uh, open repair 
for triple A is a more favorable outcome for compared to the EVA. So uh, after the kind of the data, the, your strategy for treatment of patient uh, EVA triple A is a uh, change it or uh, yeah still, now I'm getting more huh? you know conservative <laughs> so <laughs> if the patient has you know complex lesions mm -hmm. I first uh, try to I, I you know say to the patient there is a risk of reintervention and so I give the patient the options but as I said if the patient is high the relative increased risk of uh, uh, you know a surgery uh, an elderly patient then actually they do not have many options mm -hmm. so then I explain and um, they if they accept then we do you know EVA, even though uh, the, the indications are outside of the the, the, uh, the anatomies are outside of IFU mm -hmm. yeah. but uh, since I know the long-term outcome of the EVA I'm a little bit more conservative especially if I have a younger patient yeah. mm -hmm. so but many younger patients uh, they even though I try to uh, explain the risk of the intervention later but they want to have you know EVA because they have to work mm, you know? right. so if they have surgery then have to you know mm. take a rest for one or two months then right. sometimes they have you know uh, worry about their their job mm. you know? I, I wanted to ask you a question do you think that um, if we re if we redid the EVAR1 trial mm. with the current generation of stent grafts would we get the same result uh, Remember this. This was the early Anurex. Yeah, right, right, right. And Anurex, the, yeah, yeah. Anurex is still yeah. very popular. Very different. Back then, yeah. Yeah. Mm. I think the, the, the I think there is uh, the outcome maybe is slightly different, but mm. uh, you know uh, if we strictly you know follow the IFU, mm -hmm. maybe uh, long term data is not that bad, mm. but uh, you know still we don't know because there is uh, endo leaks you know that was not expected at the first place but mm. uh, uh, you know like type 1 and the leak uh, was found later in, in after beyond four or eight years so um, I, found, I found that data remarkable mm. I always think that once it's sealed it's sealed mm. but the type ones progress yeah. late mm. and I'm, I'm still finding five percent type 2 endo leaks at 10 years is mm. remarkably high in my opinion because mm. what I mean how could it still be pressurizing something that should be yeah. getting shrinking yeah. And I think this is the reason why we see a third of aneurysms get smaller, a third stay the same, and a third actually enlarge yeah. because of all these other issues that are happening. Yeah. So one of the, uh, the data I've shown uh, during my presentation was the uh, progressive increase in the LT neck diameter. So uh, at five years, uh, more than 50% of patients develop uh, the increase in uh, increase the sac diameter, uh, the aneurysm neck diameter more than 2.5 millimeters. Mm -hmm. So I think that is significant. So uh, that means, uh, you know, uh, even though the, the, the SEG is sealed now, but uh, after, you know, five years, we don't know. Right. <laughs> right? Well, it's, well, there's, it's, there's, there's it's some, anchoring to a bad part of well, the there's aorta. Well, some, there's some theory that there's an interaction between the, the aorta mm -hmm. and, the, and the expanding stent graft. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That there may actually be uh, expansion because of the stent graft. That's right, because yeah. it's anchoring on a bad Correct. part of the aorta. Yeah. That's where um, the alto, yeah. you know, the right. uh, ovation stent right. is mm -hmm. supposed to be better because it has no outward force. Right. So, yeah, no, it's, it's a, I think the data was remarkable. I, I really enjoyed that talk. Mm -hmm. Bill, let me ask you uh, your review on bioresorbable scaffolding. Mm -hmm. You know, it, to get a randomized trial through the U.S. is as I always call it, a regression to the mean. It's always a small lesion subset, and that's the lesion length on, on life BTK was short. Not terribly long, not terribly calcified, upper two-thirds. Um, just tell me I should still be happy. <laughs> <laughs> well, we all should be happy. I mean, it's the first uh, dedicated device on label uh, that was successful in, in stopping restenosis below the knee, extending patency. Um, and that's, me that's incredibly meaningful. So, yes, we should celebrate that victory. We should also be, you know, sober about what we have in terms exactly. of the data. Uh, the data are good, uh, but they're in a relatively select population of four centimeter lesions, uh, low complexity in terms of um, task cl classification, and, um, and not a lot of calcium. And so then the question becomes, okay, well, what do we do with all those other lesions? Okay, what do we do with the ones that extend into, you know, it was, they were allowed up to 17 centimeters. And they didn't even come. They came. They used a quarter of that. Uh, 
Correct. So what do we do with the other 10 centimeters that might be uh, relevant for that? Because that may get approval. I don't, who knows what the indication for use might be. Precisely. So the point is that um, we, there's still a lot of work to do in this field, and I, I'm hoping they'll do a post-market registry yeah. with, uh, in more uh, kind of all-comer status patients. Yeah. Typically, that's what we do. Uh, I know Impact, D, Impact did that nicely with the global registry, and I think we could learn a lot from a registry like that, mm -hmm. which would really help us uh, understand the place, the need for vessel preparation, mm -hmm. how much calcium can we really tolerate, how long can we do this without losing patent, how long a lesion can we treat without losing patency. I'm optimistic all those things will be sorted, but mm -hmm. we, don't, we just don't have the data right now. Right, we don't have it yet. But I think the, the future by way of publication will be, you know, they'll, they'll look at gender, I look at lesion length, I look at all sorts of things, even those that had moderate calcification compared right. to the mild, mm -hmm. and hopefully there'll be something there. Um, do you think that at least this first foray will be the metric by which other trials should design Yeah, their I mean, we, we, we did for a long time uh, believe that the trial design should be limited to six months because of the mortality issues in these patients and how difficult it is and patient loss and loss to follow up and things like that. So um, that, that became kind of the uh, standard. But, you know, Life BTK really has created a template or roadmap for us. And it, it appears, even with some of the early going uh, kind of quirks in, this, in the scaffold arm, that the real separation occurred after six months. And I think, I know that there are trials being developed now that are looking at six months, but it might be uh, at least worthwhile going out to 12 months, at least even for a secondary powered endpoint, to make certain that we're not missing where the real effect may actually be. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I mean, you know, back in Europe, they did this real PTX trial, and you saw this kind of divot, and then they crisscrossed at right. about the six to 12 month time frame. And it may very well be that this, you may see a trial that separates early, mm -hmm. and then you see late catch up, mm -hmm. or if you see separation and they maintain their right. separation, kind of like Zilver did mm -hmm. in their original trial, that would be useful. And, um, but who knows that data before you actually see it? Listen, if we learned anything, longer is better. No doubt. I'm talking about follow-up, you yeah. know, and that, you know, we, we were talking about the tricuspid valve earlier. We didn't, we didn't follow out to two years. We probably should have to see a mortality, if there's going to be a mortality difference. And the same thing with these trials, where the long-term follow-up is really not so long-term. We, we talk about one year as long-term. It's not really. It's intermediate term. Two and three years, especially for SFA, is probably the meaningful metric, and probably one year for BTK. Yeah, I would even say five years for the SFA and two to three years, depending on mortality rates, Correct. is probably beneficial there. And I, I think the, one of the important issues is uh, BTK calcification. So, but uh, uh, still, the data is a very low calcification region. Right. So how, how can um, uh, we overcome the calcification region? Well, again, this is a great question, and I think it might even be worthwhile a trial having, you know, kind of a small study in calcified lesions. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of tools now. We have IVL, we have uh, rotational or, or orbital atherectomy, even excisional atherectomy, <coughs> excuse me, in the proximal vessels. And I, I, my sense is that uh, with, with adequate vessel preparation, we'll probably do okay. Mm -hmm. But if we take any lessons from the coronary experience with absorb, we know that this is a very important subject and that target vessel failure will occur if we're not adequately prep preparing these vessels. Mm -hmm. So again, I think more studies required. I, I wouldn't want to try to look into a crystal ball at this point, but it's a very important subset of patients, given that most of the patients with below the knee disease have a lot of calcification, so it's real. Yeah, and, and to add to that, CTO data, you mm -hmm. know, because occlusive disease is probably more likely, and it almost always runs all the way down to the ankle, right. mm -hmm. and then you're working both inflow and outflow for a lot of these mm -hmm. Rutherford four and fives. And so, uh, yeah, I think that there's going to be a lot more to it than just simple, um, you know, well, scaffold for a short lesion. That's another level of complexity we haven't talked about. But, you know, the, this was, uh, I believe these patients had to have good runoff into the foot. They couldn't have disease to the ankle. So um, what's going to happen when we put a scaffold in, maybe a longer scaffold, where the runoff is poor or compromised? Precisely. That's a whole other conversation around, um, you know, maintaining flow and avoiding uh, complications and adverse events. I couldn't enroll one patient because I had uh, eight centimeters rather than 10 centimeters from the ankle joint. <laughs> so that, yeah, right. that's a perfect example. Yeah. And again, as a trialist, I understand why you do that. Yeah, yeah. You know, you have to minimize the confounders and try to get your device to show its effects. But now we have to figure out how to use it. Yeah, and, and <clears throat> the one thing that BTK did that I think is just remarkable is that 
unlike the other trials that have gone before it, they aimed their arrow at one little spot on the target and they had the, the wherewithal to actually narrow down their patient population. So the heterogeneity of this group was very That's right. homogeneous, That's right. not heterogeneic. And that to me was one of the key elements as to why it was a victory. And the, or, uh, today in, in Korea, the SFA region, we frequently use the DCB for compared to DS. And, the, 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 and, uh, and also Dr. Uh, President ACC, uh, IBUS with the DCB is very uh, good outcome compared to IBUS with uh, or NGO with the DS. So, uh, how about the United States? DCB is more frequently used in SFA region or compared to DS? Right now, um, of the antiproliferative therapies, DCB is more frequent than DES. Mm -hmm. um, IVUS is now becoming more recognized as a necessary adjunct to above the knee and below the knee mm -hmm. interventions, especially with non scaffolded, non, non stented lesions where angiography is probably not adequate to judge the patency of that vessel. Um, so uh, I think to optimize outcomes, it's pretty clear that IVUS is useful. Adjunctive imaging, like in the coronaries, pretty much anywhere we've looked at IVUS use, it's, it's, it's been a benefit to the long-term outcome of the patient. It really goes back to the old adage, bigger is better, right? You right. can get wider, your MLDs go you know, to a much bigger uh, right. degree, and that plays a role in both short-term benefit, but more importantly, long-term durability. And, uh, and, you know, getting back to the above knee and below knee, um, you know, help me out because I, I, I'm trying to understand the difference between the basal, as you say, or basal, as I say, um, outcomes versus best CLI. Mm -hmm. in, in outside of the U.S. and inside the U.S., what, what is your take on the difference? Because I honestly think that there's a, it's kind of profound. Well, you summarized it nicely in your talk, but I think one of the big deals is that the Endpoint of amputation free survival is a very uh, dull tool to assess mm -hmm. differences between therapies. Having said that, um, they did see a difference in amputation free survival in, in Basel II, and largely related to probably the surgical influence of, of survival. But the problem, but, but the difference in the trials is that they didn't they didn't specify the patient had to be a good surgical candidate. Right. Uh, in Basel II, but you did have to be. So they cherry-picked a little bit, which is okay. Clinically, that's appropriate and relevant. But the biggest problem I have with, with best CLI is that they, did, they have a, the, the, the end point that drove, the, the end point that drove the composite, the, 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 the component end point that drove the composite end point towards surgery was an unadjudicated end point. Exactly. Which was early reintervention. Mm -hmm. That's a problem when, when, it's your, when it's the thing that's deriving the trial outcome. We would never do that in an FDA device trial. It would always be adjudicated by a core lab and a CEC committee that was unadjudicated. The second thing is, as much as people want to dispute this, it was 80% surgeons. And nothing against surgeons, but the, the, that's not representative of what the current interventional community is in the United States doing BTK disease. Probably about 40% surgeons and the rest IR and cardiology. Right. And that may or may not make a difference. But if you're, if you're you know, if you're the uh, uh, judge and jury, it's, it's pretty easy to have a trial go your way. Yeah. It, it, you know, the 40% crossover was a huge number for the early interventions. It seems they had a huge number of failures in best CLI, and I think that without an interventional monitoring committee, that, become a, that becomes a bigger issue. Do you have 40%? Do you no, have but forty percent but... failure below the knee. You? But, no. but look, if we no, if, you don't. If we individually adjudicate it and it Come comes on. out that way, then so be it. But to me, the idea of that number being that high is just—it doesn't seem plausible no. in the short term. So, yeah, something wrong with that number. Yeah, something was up. How did how does the outside of the U.S. You know, take uh, uh, these you know, trials? The problem with me is, uh, is that um, usually. The, the studies does not, do not reflect our daily practice. Yeah. Yeah. No? Our patients who require you know, intervention or surgery, uh, the, the, the intervention for wound healing, you know, they are mostly uh, hemodialysis patients, elderly patients, and diabetic patients with you know, a lot of comorbidities. And yeah. I don't think they, uh, the surgery is the right choice for them. You know? So maybe as, as you know, uh, endovascular therapy fails, then we can consider as a second option, but you know, the I think uh, 
we don't have many uh, vascular surgeons who do this right. kind of job. And, uh, and also, I think these patients are so sick, I think uh, they cannot undergo surgery. Well, the, one, one thing I would oh, say yeah. about Basel, I'm, I'm sorry, about Bestiolite, mm -hmm. which changed my practice. One is that I think I do vein map everybody I take who has complex disease, mm -hmm. CLI. Yeah. And, if, and if somebody looks like they're really going to be a long, complex, calcified CTL mm -hmm. reconstruction, mm -hmm. and they're a good surgical candidate, I'll send them to surgery. I'm not going to, re, I'm not right. going to undertake that. Because surgery is good, mm -hmm. and there's no question about that. The other thing is that there aren't enough surgeons in the United States to do all the critical limb surgery mm -hmm. that's needed. No. Okay, I don't yeah. know how it is in Korea, <laughs> but it's, there's not enough patients, there's not enough surgeons. Yeah. So we have to do some endovascular reconstruction. It's, it's just a fact right. of life, like you said. Yeah. Yeah. I think Sensei Yokoi uh, said that, uh, showed it in his slides where the more risk factors you have in a clodican, mm -hmm. the more mortality you had. And I thought, I've, we were chatting about that mm -hmm. up on, on podium. It's just, we don't see that kind of data. Mm -hmm. So I think we're going over time, but um, I just want to thank everybody. It was a great session, a great opportunity to review the data and really kind of dive deep into, uh, you know, aortic disease and then SFA and below knee disease uh, that we'd hardly ever get to see. So Dr. Choi, thank you. And thank you. Uh, we look forward to coming back to TCTAP for the 2025. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.